Hey guys, um, <clears throat> as I'm dying inside, apparently, uh, this uh, sinus infection doesn't want to die. It's like nursing school. It just slowly squeezes the life out of you. So um, let's talk about renal. Renal, uh, let's do some um, renal practice questions. So the purpose of this video is to um, look at not only some content around um, AKI, chronic renal dialysis, kidney transplant, but it's also to go into taste taking strategies and other things that you might encounter in these kind of questions or others. Now, this is not the perfect end all be all. I am not the ultimate resource um, for you, but um, I just am one person who maybe can provide some tools. Keep in mind when it comes to studying and test taking strategies, it is, it's kind of a crapshoot where, you know, sometimes I'm going to tell you a general rule, but just know it's a general rule. It doesn't always work for every question, every time. Um, but hopefully some of these strategies or some of this knowledge will come together um, and create a, a great success for yourself. Um, please take whatever this, if this can help you, and um, I'm sure you'll be successful in your journey. Let's move forward. Question one it says, a nurse is reviewing labs for a client with end-stage renal disease. Um, based on the results below, what is the priority action? So uh, first, anytime you're reading a renal question, you want to see what, where are they at? Are they AKI? They have an acute problem, a chronic renal, or are they end stage? So this patient's end stage renal. So um, I'm going to be worried about a lot of their electrolytes and things like that. So their creatinine's 5.9. Hmm, would I expect that in end stage renal? That sounds about right. Phosphorus 6.9. That's elevated. Um, sounds about right for end stage renal. And potassium 6.3, hmm, that's probably what, to me, if I was just looking at this real quick, I would say that's the most concerning one because an elevated creatinine and elevated phosphorus is not going to cause a life or death issue, um, but an elevated potassium could possibly cause, you know, my favorite dysrhythmias. So um, let's look at this. So the first choice is what's the priority actions? What do I need to do first? So some of these might be correct, but what's the most important thing to do? So the first one says, A, um, call for an order for fluid replacement. Well, this is an end-stage renal patient. I can't imagine any um, option uh, with fluid replacement being appropriate for this patient. It's not that we never, ever in our lives give fluid to a renal patient, but it's very rare that um, uh, fluid is going to fix them. So B says, check the patient's blood pressure. So, you know, when you have a situation like this, you do always want to consider, could an assessment give me information that would change the course of action I'm about to take. So I could take their blood pressure, but regardless of what it is, it doesn't change the fact that the patient's potassium is 6.3 and that can cause a dysrhythmia. Um, so, and I don't necessarily need to know what their blood pressure is for the doctor to make a decision about treating their potassium. So I always have to consider that too. Is there any assessments that need to be made before the doctor could place an order to do something about that potassium? And there's nothing about blood pressure that's going to help me decide on which treatment is appropriate for a patient with a high potassium. Um, C is call for an order of IV insulin. Hmm. I think IV insulin is a treatment for high potassium, but I'm going to keep going. Um, apply nasal cannula on the client. So a lot of times people will choose oxygen because sometimes it just seems like the first thing it's really super quick and doesn't everybody need oxygen, but would oxygen change their potassium at all? Hmm, I don't think it will. So really the only one of these that is going to immediately take action to fix a problem is going to be C. Um, and um, th that's the only one that's specific to this problem. So to answer this question, one, I would have to have a knowledge of my labs. So that's probably why this would be um, your labs or something good to keep on your note cards if you want to have something um, to reference if you struggle with remembering them. Um, but um, two, I would, so I would, because I would need to know which of these is a problem, but two, I would need to know what to do about them. Like what's the priority action. Um, and so again, you have to look at which of these are actually going to be actions that are going to fix the problem or address the problem. And before I address or fix the problem, is there any assessments that I need to make? Um, and so um, there are no assessments I need to make. My potassium 6.3, I need to take action right away. And I'm going to take action by calling for an order of, um, to get an order for IV insulin. I would say, because of course my brain, this is what my brain always does. It starts thinking about alternative answer choices. So the only um, assessment or other action that may come before this, if it was a choice, is attaching a client to a cardiac monitor um, to make sure that they're doing okay until I can get them their um, IV insulin treatment. Because um, before I give them the IV insulin calcium gluconate and D50, I do want them attached to a cardiac monitor to monitor their heart um, stability.
All right, question two. A nurse is caring for a client in the oligarch phase of acute kidney injury. What priority assessment should the nurse complete for this client? So again, so I'm going to go back in the question. Okay, oligarch phase AKI. So I'm in an acute kidney problem. I don't necessarily going to have, I'm not going to necessarily have long-term problems. And I'm in oligarch, which means not a lot of urine. So I'm making not a lot of urine and I'm in acute kidney injury. So it's my priority assessment. So listen to lung sounds. Well, I like it because it's lung sounds and you know, I always think airway and breathing and stuff like that. But is it priority for this patient? Is there anything going on with their lungs? I don't know, I'm gonna keep going. Check their creatinine. So um, for a patient that's an AKI, I know a lot of times students really love thinking like, oh, kidney issues, check the creatinine. But you have to think here, um, what do you call them? Well, checking like, is, the, is that number going to change? Is like what that number is gonna change something in my care. And regardless of how high it is, um, when it comes to kidney stuff or like, regardless of how high their actual creatinine, creatinine is, cause that's why serum creatinine is not the best like lab to look at. Like, I'm not going to look and be like, Oh, it's 4.7. I need to do something different now. Really with kidneys, it comes down to function. Are they peeing or not? Like what's going on? So, I mean, if I had a patient in the oligarch phase, which that usually means they're not peeing a lot, and whether their creatinine is 2.7 or 10.9, it's not going to necessarily change what I'm doing. So, um, you know, that's not, I wouldn't say it's a priority thing to do because maybe, maybe, yes, I probably need to know what their creatinine is so I can tr make sure it's trending down. Um, but um, it's not something that's going to be priority for me because um, even though they are a kidney patient, it's not going to change my actions for my care right now today. Um, C is auscultate heart sounds. So, um, you know, I, I don't really see a lot of connection. I mean, I love the heart and, you know, that's what I would, is always my priority assessment um, for me as a nurse, just because I love the heart, but, um, you know, is it really priority for a patient with AKI? And I don't really think um, about them, acute kidney injury, um, necessarily that like listening to their heart sounds um, is going to tell me anything. Um, that's, uh, that's key or like, if anything, of course, yes, I'm going to listen to it, but it's not what I'm thinking about right away. Now I know some of you guys are probably thinking maybe this is true because with oligarch phase, they can have electrolyte imbalances like high potassium. Um, but if they are, if I'm going to catch a dysrhythmia, I'm not going to catch it from listening to it. I'm going to catch it from seeing it on a cardiac monitor. Um, so I wouldn't say that that's really the best answer there. Um, then the last one's assess capillary refill. Um, and I don't think a perfusion is like as much, it, perfu I mean, flow and perfusion is an issue with everything, um, but um, it's not necessarily a priority here. It's not like I'm worried about their ability to get flow to their fingers and toes, like there's some sort of obstruction. So really what this question's asking me is which body systems are like, you know, really key to evaluate. So far, like, I don't really think it's B because again, I don't think that's the best answer. I think it is a potential answer um, for this in general, but it's not necessarily going to be the best thing that's going to help here. Um, and so then um, heart sounds, again, I just don't think it's as specific. So you have to think about what most directly is going to change something I'm about to do. Um, and like I said, capillary refill, there's no sort of obstruction, blockage, or decrease in circulation to my peripheral tissue. So I don't really see how it's necessarily going to help. But if I listen to lung sounds, I have to go back to remember oliguric um, it's three, um, uh, th uh, we, I think this is what we, maybe we said that for, yeah, for one of the study sessions, I was, and we talked about three W's, um, we said that for kidney in general, but I think it goes pretty good with, um, oligarch too. So they're full of waste. Um, they're full of water and, um, there was it, was it three W's. Yeah. And there, I feel like it was like they were tired, fatigued or what it was a week. That's it. So yeah. So, um, full of waste, full of water and weak. Um, and so a lot of times that's, uh, you know, how they're going to be during the oligarch phase or in general chronic kidney, um, you know, water, um, waste and weak. And so, um, if you want to think of three W's and look, it's like your fingers, three W's, you like that? Um, that just made my night. Woo. So yes. So, um, needless to say, um, this is the joys. This is like how sad my life has become. I get really excited when I create mnemonics and this is the only joy I have left in my life. So, um, thank you for, um, Thank you uh, for always uh, bringing me joy. And I, I won't say the person student's name out loud because um, it may embarrass them when they watch this video, but you know who you are. And so um, needless to say, 
um, oligarch face, they are full of waste, water, and they are weak. So if they're full of water, listening to their lung sounds could help me because it's going to help me to assess or see what their fluid status is. So I have to really think about priorities and priorities in the oligarch phase is uh, making, uh, you know, uh, watching their urine output, watching their, um, their fluid status and uh, monitoring electrolytes and protecting their neurological status. Um, so out of the, the, out of knowing that out of these choices, the best answer is going to be a for me. Question three, a uh, nurse is caring for a client with chronic kidney disease. Now we're in chronic. I'm receiving epoid and alpha. Oh no, it's a med question. Um, which information is most important to evaluate before administering this medication? Um, so I'm giving a medication and the question is asking me what information is most important to evaluate before administering this. Um, so um, with a question like this, it's not, um, it's really important because a lot of times um, you could read this and then you could um, easily think that it's saying, how are you going to know it's effective, but it's not saying, you know, how are you going to know it's effective? It's pretty much saying which of these, if I don't check before could lead to consequences of which of these, if I don't check could lead to deadly issues. So um, the first one is most recent blood pressure. So I have to think if their blood pressure was super low or super high, would it not be safe to give the epoetin alpha or the EPO? So it, regardless of what my blood pressure is, it shouldn't affect their ability to receive the EPO. Um, uh, what do you call it? That's not why I'm not giving it for blood pressure and um, it shouldn't directly affect the blood pressure at least immediately. Um, <clears throat> the second one is most recent potassium levels. So I have to think about is giving EPO and creating more red blood cells gonna affect my potassium? I don't really think so. Uh, most recent oxygen saturation, low or high, doesn't matter. Um, if it's low, the EPO won't necessarily immediately help, but it may over time be helpful. Um, and um, so there, again, it's kind of like the blood pressure. There's nothing about that that's going to necessarily change um, the safety for giving it. Could any harm come to the patient if I gave it, if their O2 sat was high or low? And there's really no, um, no harm there. Then the last one's most recent hemoglobin level. So this one we have to consider if it was super low, well, you know, that's probably why they're getting the EPO. If it's super high though, it would not be safe to give EPO because if I give EPO, which helps me to create more red blood cells, therefore more hemoglobin, um, you know, then that's, I'm going to end up um, uh, and if you want to remember this process, the kidneys make EPO, which is like a cheerleader tells the bone marrow to make more red blood cells because the kidneys themselves do not make blood cells. Um, but if my, um, if I, if my hemoglobin's already high and I'm giving EPO, then it's going to go even higher. And the higher my hemoglobin is, the higher, the, the thicker my blood is, the more I am at risk for clots. So, um, the only one of these that could directly affect um, EPO is going to be the hemoglobin level, level. So D is the best answer here. So a new graduate nurse is learning about peritoneal dialysis treatment. So anytime you're reading a dialysis treatment, you want to make sure you're reading which type of dialysis. So it says, which statement if made by the new graduate nurse indicates more teaching is needed. So A says this client needs their temperature taken regularly. So, I mean, that seems to make sense because a lot of dialysis accesses were worried about infection. So I like that answer, um, but let's keep going. B says, I will check the fistula for a thrill and a brewery. Um, so a fistula that goes with hemodialysis. I don't think it goes with peritoneal dialysis. So I'm going to go ahead and cross that one out because I think that's in to trick me. Um, who would have tricked? Why would I trick myself? It's so mean to myself. Um, I'm going to stop making jokes and talking about myself in the third person, I promise. Um, I will check the client's weight on a daily basis. Um, so, you know, I mean, that sounds something that is, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, reasonable, um, you know, cause like, I mean, definitely we want to kind of check on, see how their weight's doing and make sure they're not gaining any weight unnecessarily. Um, then the last one is this client will not need to be on a fluid restriction. So I know that some people need to be on a fluid restriction. Some people don't, but I think because peritoneal dialysis is more of continuous or more regular, they don't have to worry about their fluid as much. So, so far, I think a is, is good because we want to check their temperature because they, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, they have a line or a tube that could get infected. 
Um, I think C is good because they um, can have fluid shifts and stuff like that with their dialysis. So I need to know what their weight is because that tells me their fluid status. I think D is good um, because um, they're regularly getting dialysis. I don't think they need a fluid restriction. So the only one that is incorrect would be B, um, that they need to check for a fistula for a thrill and a brewery because that goes with hemodialysis, not peritoneal. Um, so the key here, though, too, is reading the question carefully, because um, if you read it super quickly and then read chance choice A and thought that the question was asking um, which one shows that the teaching was effective, you could easily choose A because um, it's correct and think that that's what it is. But make sure you re recognize that it's asking for what is wrong, not what is right. Question five. A client with intravenal acute kidney injury is wanting to know more about risk factors for their condition. Which of the following statements by the nurse is most accurate? Um, so um, intrarenal, so there's something going on inside their kidneys. And if you remember intrarenal, it's, oh, never mind. That's a part of the question. We'll get to it. Never mind. Shh. Just shut up, Catherine. All right, I'm to stop talking to myself. Um, this is what happens. This is why I don't, I haven't made a video in a while because all I have is late nights and late nights are dangerous for my brain because I am fairly sleep deprived. So anyway, back to the question. Client intrarenal acute kidney injury. It's wanting to know more about risk factors for their condition. So this is really saying what causes intrarenal acute kidney injury. So it's saying which of these statements is true. So pretty much this is assessing my knowledge to see if I know what causes intrarenal AKI. Um, and so um, if you look at choice A, um, and well, if you look at all these choices, uh, they all start with your condition is usually a result of. So I can really, you know, kind of cross that out. I'm seeing, okay, which of these is related to intrarenal? So the first one says kidney stones or prostate problems. That sounds like an obstruction and that is post-renal. So I don't think that's right. Um, the second one is cardiovascular disease and hypertension. That sounds like heart issues and flow issues. That's usually pre-renal. Um, infection or medication that harm the kidneys. That sounds like it could be intrarenal, but let me look at my last choice. Loss of fluid and dehydration. That's another flow or um, heart issue. And so I really am thinking pre-renal for that. So based on this, this is a knowledge question. Um, the best answer here is going to be C because um, intrarenal is all about stuff that's happening in the kidney, like they get infection, they have an autoimmune disease, they take drugs um, that can affect their kidneys like antibiotics, iodine contrast, NSAIDs, et cetera. Um, and um, these uh, things can end up harming the kidney. Um, so I think C is gonna be the correct answer and I am right. So yes, um, and I do not make these um, just to say I am right eight times because I actually like being wrong, but this is probably the only time in my life that I'm ever right is on this, um, what do you call it? Um, and I'm not gonna make a strange joke about how I'm always right um, against my husband, but yes, just know I am always right against him though. Anyway, question six, a client with chronic kidney disease is learning to read food labels. Which nutrients should the nurse tell the client to avoid an increased intake of? Select all that apply. Hmm. So it's saying, which of these do I need to avoid um, that I don't want to have too much of a high intake of? Answer choice A is protein. Okay, well, I can definitely get on board with that. Um, so protein um, is not, uh, we do not want um, for, and again, we have to go back and read this chronic kidney because sometimes the nutrients change as you go through. Um, so um, for a patient that is chronic kidney, I do not want them to have too much protein. So I'm going to say yes, true. Um, potassium. I know they definitely don't want too much of that because it can lead to dysrhythmia. So I've got A and B so far. So I'm going to say that's true. Phosphorus. Um, that as well. I know that they can definitely have an increased intake of that. I know they need to take those phosphate binders. Um, so I'm, I got my three P's so far. Um, then I have sodium. I think sodium as well. I definitely think that you want to restrict that because it can cause you to hold on to more water. Um, and then last but not least is iron. Now iron is something I actually think they can be low in. Um, so I think it is okay for them to have an increased intake of iron as long as it doesn't interact with the other things. Here's the thing you're going to find is the renal diet is so impossible. Like you need to increase intake of some stuff, but then that stuff, you have to have the right foods because, I mean, it's just impossible to find stuff that are low protein, low potassium, low phosphorus, low sodium. 
Um, it's in a lot of these patients are diabetic too. Um, so it's really hard to find a diet that works. So if you're a, um, I've seen patients that are renal, um, diabetic cardiovascular. I mean, it's like literally there's no foods on their tray. Um, it's really sad, but um, you have to keep in mind, it's not that you can have none of these things. You just want a lower intake of these things. So the trick I was talking about in my other, um, uh, you know, enrichment session um, was about how, um, and this is also trademarked from a student, and I mentioned the student's name in that video, but because that is sheltered and not on the internet, I'm not going to mention the student's name, but you know who you are, CT. Um, and so um, they came up with a great mnemonic for um, remembering um, the electrolytes you want to avoid as NP3. So N as in um, sodium, like think like NA, like sodium. Um, and so, um, is your first one and then, um, P, um, three, so the three P's are, sorry, or you can say N three P or N P three. Um, but it's, um, sodium, potassium, phosphorus, and protein. So there's three P's and one N or N P three. Um, so that's what you want to avoid for chronic kidney. Question seven, a nurse is caring for a client with an arterial venous graft on their left arm, which assessment finding would warrant an immediate call to the physician. Um, so this patient, they have, um, this is an access or device question. So I need to know how to properly care for this device. I need to know what this device is. And then what are the signs that it's normal or what are the signs where it's a problem? And this is something I can definitely, while I'm studying, write down, like, when do I need to call? So the first choice is client's hand is pink and skin is blanchable with touch. Well, I think that's normal. Pink is good. It means flow. And if the skin is blanchable, that's like, that's good. You know, I mean, when I touch it, then it, you know, there's a return of color. So I like that. Um, the nurse can feel a palpable vibration on the graft. Well, I believe that's called a thrill. And I think they're supposed to have that. Um, client's capillary refill is greater than three seconds on their left hand. Well, I think it's supposed to be less than three seconds. So I don't like that, but let's keep looking. A swishing sound when listening to the graft with the stethoscope. So that, that would that warrant anything? So um, that sounds like a brewery to me. I think they're supposed to have that. So A, B, and D all sound like what's expected, whereas C is something that's not expected. If they're having a um, prolonged capillary refill, it could be a sign of arterial steel syndrome or a sign of um, compromised circulation in that hand. So we want to always be cautious um, with patients that have these devices because what can happen is all the blood flow that should be going to their hands can sometimes get diverted and start going more to that graft and then their hand can literally go like ischemic. So we want to be looking, doing our six P's and one C um, and making sure the, the perfusion is um, remaining intact. Last but not least, a nurse is caring for a client who has just returned, I should say, to the floor after receiving a kidney transplant four hours ago. Based on the output record below, what is the priority action? So I, um, anytime there's time, I need to consider time. So they're just got back. It's been four hours. Um, it's saying based on the output record below, what's the priority action? So at seven o'clock, they had a thousand out eight o'clock. They had 1200, nine o'clock. They only had a hundred. So they had pretty much what this is telling me is they had a steep decrease in their urine output. It's so really what I need to ask myself is if, if a patient had a steep decrease in their urine output in um, the immediate post-operative period, what's my priority action? So when I'm thinking priority action, um, and I'm, uh, you know, what I really need to think about is what action am I going to take that's going to have the most direct effect, or what action am I going to take that is going to fix this problem or most directly get to the bottom of this problem? Because maybe I need to assess something, or maybe I need to um, take action. So the first is call the physician immediately. Now, anytime you see call the physician immediately in the answer choice, you need to think about is there anything I can do to possibly fix or like troubleshoot this problem that could save their life quicker than fault calling the physician um, or fix the problem. Um, is there anything I can do first? That's not going to prolong, um, you know, or but, sorry, that's not going to prolong like life-saving care. Like if there's life-saving care that this patient needs right now, there's nothing I can do. I need to call the physician. I need to make sure that one, that there's nothing life-saving that I can do right now to fix this problem or to, um, I uh, start, you know, making things better or two, is there any assessments I need to make before I call the doctors so that way when I call them, they're not like, Hey, did you try this? Or, Hey, what does this look like? Or, you know, any assessment findings they might need, like what's their blood pressure? What's their oxygen, whatever that might not apply for this question, but I'm just uh, giving you examples. 
So I'm going to look at the other answer choices. Anytime I have called the physician, I want to look at the other answer choices first. So the first one says increased hourly fluid rate per protocol. Now I know kidney transplants are on hourly fluids and I, whatever they're losing, I'm replacing. So increasing the hourly fluid kind of sounds like a good choice, but it seems like there was such a steep decrease that there maybe is something else going on. So I think that if I increase that, maybe, but it seems like there may be something going on where something's not functioning the way it's supposed to. So the next one says check the client blood pressure. So then I have to think about it. Okay. There's something going on that's either blocking their urine from coming out or their kidneys are failing. I don't know. Um, so, um, you know, if checking their, the client's blood pressure, is that going to tell me anything that's going to make a big difference? Is it going to change the fact that they don't have urine output? Probably not. Do I maybe need to know what it is? Do you know, make sure that they're not, you know, something else going on possibly, but it's not necessarily the first thing that I want to do. Cause if there's a urine problem, I have to think of urine solutions. So then I have irrigate the catheter to remove possible obstructions. So I do know that um, after a transplant, they can get clots in their catheter and those clots could cause obstruction. This could lead to that. So it could be as simple as that. So um, there could be something worse going on like rejection or other things like that. But first I need to assess, you know, uh, what's that saying? Like you need to, if you hear, you know, like footsteps or hooves or something, you should assume whatever a normal animal is that has hooves and not assume something crazy. Yeah, that's the, the best that I can do with that analogy. But in other words, um, always think of like, you know, if there's something basic that I could do to solve a problem, like if there is just a, you know, like a clot or something in the tube and I just need to flush it, um, if I can do that first before calling the doctor and um, uh, what do you call it? And it could possibly relieve an obstruction, that would be great. And then instead of calling the doctor and him coming in and being like, hey, you just need to flush the tube. So, um, or, you know, we're getting all alarmed and thinking there's rejection. It's not again that maybe I don't need to call if that doesn't work, but if there's any actions I can take before calling the physician that may fix the problem, I should take those. And D, I can try to fix the problem because um, this is a realistic and direct way to fix the problem. Um, then um, I can go ahead and take that answer. So the correct answer here is D. I'm going to irrigate and try to do that. Now, if that doesn't work, um, then I'm probably going to, um, you know, uh, be doing a quick assessment of their site, their symptoms, um, get their blood pressure and call the physician because then I'd be worried about acute rejection um, happening, et cetera. Um, so, yeah. And if anyone who's kind of stuck on B, why would we not just increase, increase their hourly fluid rate? Um, if there is an obstruction or something present that could make things worse and they could end up getting bladder rupture or more, more serious complications. The thing that would cue me on that is there's such a steep decrease in their urine output, which is not at all expected right after they come back from kidney transplant. Right after kidney transplant, they're having lots of output and they can have um, a thousand um, mLs out or more an hour. And that can be expected. And I need to replace mill for mill how much they're losing. All right, we made it through this one too, and I'm only still partially insane. So you survived me and I will keep on surviving too. Um, you guys got this. See you for the next one.